Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valerio Leowulf and welcome to today's lecture on YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the most exciting games that happen in the uh, candidates tournament and I would like to bring you to uh, a few of my favorites so that you could actually see how um, instructive it was. Now the candidates finished, yet the key lessons remain. So what I'm going to bring up is the first game that I think was really, really brilliant. And that's actually going to be a game that Karana managed to win, which literally uh, secured him the challenger's position. Now, once again, you have to know that each of those games represents a brilliant learning um you know technique and experience so i think that it's just brilliant beautiful that we got to we got to see these but um let me bring up uh, what i think you could learn most from it so give me one second i'm gonna set it up the first one and uh, we can talk about it together so uh, now somebody asked me how much do I think, what are the chances of Karana winning Carlson? I think there are fine. I do not believe that he is going to be, uh, you know, as easy of a player as any of challenger of, of Carlson's uh, previous challengers. But I do wish to say that it was, um, it's going to be very instructive to see each of these games being played, um, you know, very, you know, soon. So, I'd like to bring up my thoughts on what I believe, why I believe that he could be the next world champion. And of course, his best game as to uh, what he was able to do in order to successfully win. So let me get the um, first game open here. There's a little problem with my play, with my chess here. So one second. Yes, here we go. So the game that I want to show you was played between Karan and Grischuk. This was the last game. It was a very difficult, very tough game. But uh, why do I want to bring that game up? Because it shows three specific techniques. The first technique being learning how you could basically defend, you know, and figure out the most precise candidate moves when you're playing. The second one would be about opening and how can you actually handle the opening mm -hmm. a little bit better in a critical game dealing with the pressure and of course uh, the final technique which is basically keeping the stability this means man managing the risk so i'm going to bring up a very solid idea on how that worked okay so let's see grishuk was playing with the white pieces so we're going to look at it from the black side and white basically started with e4, e5, now knight of three, knight of six, and d4. So um, this is an opening that I do not believe fits too well, um, the general winning strategy, so to speak, for black. I mean, what I mean by this is that usually white is supposed to get a lot more than just a nice d4 break. So what happens after the move d4? is that black simply takes with knight takes d4, and then after d takes to the e5, he plays d5. Now, every time when you play the opening, you want to get in a position that gives you more space, good opportunities, solid ways to succeed. Now, that's the problem here, that white doesn't really get any of that. There is no chance for him to create any real threats. And uh, so black is able to effectively play with the move of pawn up to the d5 and then actually concentrate on bringing his bishop on the c5 as well as the knight on c6. So step by step, what we find out is that black is able to improve and get everything going. So what are we going to do? What, what's happening right now in this position? Okay, so after the move of pawn up to d5, of course, there is the idea of the black bishop coming out on c5. There is the challenge, the pressure that eventually we're creating so that we could uh, attack against the opponent, the bishop pawn on f2. So white played knight d2 and hope that after knight takes to the d2 and then bishop takes to the d2, 
everything is going to be good. Of course, he developed the bishop. Now, what should black be doing in this position? Develop simply. The first thing to be successful in play like a grandmaster really stands to be this very simple idea of making things simple. In fact, that's what I believe every player must strive. But people don't do that. People think about all sorts of complicated moves and tactical ideas, which really don't work in most times. What we need instead is simplicity. So how do you exactly achieve that level of simplicity? The first way, the first possibility, is by thinking about developing our pieces on purpose. Now, by, by Black having this bishop go to the uh, e7 square, we can realize what this really is. It takes away the g5, so White can't move uh, himself right there. And then the other thing that matters a lot isn't just the fact that uh, White will be stopped from playing a move of knight of the g5. It's mostly the fact that black can very easily castle. See? So you can see the difference here. We can castle. Everything's going to work out fine. And white will have enough to worry. Very, very valuable in this position specifically. So what's going on next? After the bishop e7 move was played, apparently, white didn't love this. So what he did was play bishop d3. Now, what makes an opening really successful is the amount of space that we can actually get against the opponent. And that is exactly why black was really relying very heavily on the idea, and so he played with the move of pawn to c5. What this does is something incredibly valuable. It helps, first of all, to control the squares of c5, c4 and d4 that are apparently very helpful. But more importantly, what it will do is that black can now develop his own knight right at the c6, so that when, when it steps behind the pawns, he can focus on playing with the move of um, bishop to the g4. We could get ahead with a short castling and so on, which should work perfect. And take a look at this. It is always and every single time about one thing, making sure that we do not slow down the development. Everything else is secondary. See, continuing and keeping up with your development is the highest, the first priority that we can have. That's why Black focused on playing c5, c3, and now was knight c6. Short castles and bishop to g4. If you look at it this way, you find out uh, the real reason why uh, this works. I mean, after knight of the c6 and bishop to the g4 in plays, black is just being perfect. It's no wonder that, um, you know, Karana eventually went on to win the game. We're going to see exactly how he did it. But it's, it's beautiful. So this is how it works. Knight c6. So white castle, and then black played bishop g4. Rook e1 and queen d7. I mean, look at how this goes. Slowly and carefully bringing out the pieces on the positions that we most need them. The bishop is currently pinning the pawns, and that's beautiful. And uh, so let's take a look. After that, I place h3. And this was a really interesting moment because it's clear to see what White is doing. He just wants to push the bishop back and make it work well. Black plays bishop h5. Do you see how easy this looks? It is supposed to be easy. The moment we start overcomplicating it is the moment where things start to be bad. After bishop h5, White did bishop f4. And Black plays queen e6. The intention in most of these um, situations is really the ability to get ahead and make sure that we position our pieces on their best squares. Now with the queen right in front of the white pawn, black is doing um, a great job. It's no advance, nothing to bother us, not in this position at least. And what is so good about this also is that um, you know we're we're going to have a tremendous follow up. We can castle, we can go ahead with um, a move like uh, you know King B8. 
all feels excellent. So right now, black is a good game. Now what really happens in this position? <clears throat> what really happens in here is very interesting. So if the queen e6 is being played, um, white basically attempted to do a3. And right after the move of a3, black plays a short castles. So this is excellent. Here, b4 and h6. Bishop to the g3 and b6. I want you to take a look at how effectively black's pieces come together. It is not about the tactics. It's not about the setup. It's not about any of that. All that black wants in this position is to make sure that each piece goes on a proper position so they so these pieces can actually do something. And and they do. That's what they that's right, they do. C5 is being perfectly well protected so that there's no complications along the route and along the way. And the rest is great. Why does black win this game? Because of his positional approach. I see so many times players going and heading in all sorts of different directions without knowing, um, you know, like what is most important. And I always say the most important about these positions is making sure you keep the integrity of your position. Okay, so this is where it really comes to. Always comes down to that idea. We need to keep the integrity of our position so that no matter what happens, no matter what goes, we're ready. And that's beautiful. So now with that in mind, apparently White actually wanted to do knight d4. He wanted to free himself up and do something that's going to give him the chance to attack. So he pushed it that way, of course. After this um, knight to the d4, okay, it was the moment for Black to actually capture, take, take, root, take. Now, many people would call this an equal end game. I mean, why not? What's the black advantage? There doesn't seem to be anything special. Uh, White gets the rooks. He has the space. He has the activity. I mean, what should black do now? I've always found end games exciting. Although, for the most chess players, end games are a complete mystery. And usually the reason for this is because they have no idea how end games are supposed to be played. I mean, what really matters in the end games? How do we know if we should improve, uh, you know, regroup, develop? You know, what do we, what how do, what do we, how do we do? In an end game position, the first thing that you need to know is that it's all about improvement. I like to consider that it's almost like building a Lego out of nothing. No, you know, scheme. Nothing specific that we could even figure out that well. So we just have our Lego and we have the idea of, okay, we need to build something beautiful as we go along. It's all about improvisation and it's all about figuring out the right way to improvise it so that we don't expose ourselves or our position and we don't allow the opponent an unnecessary counterplay. It was very interesting because this is exactly the one thing that Black cares about as he goes in this position. Once White plays the move of Rook AD1, Black played C4. The key thing in every that makes every end game, almost every end game, incredibly successful is the idea that if you want to make it great, you really need to expand. And what does expanding really mean? I mean, in that sense, expanding means just generally one thing. It's getting enough space and getting enough power to force our opponent back. Sometimes that's basically connects one or two pawn moves to push him down. Other times it's about improving certain pieces. Whatever it is, though, don't forget that it takes time to do it. And yet, there is nothing more valuable that will serve you in a longer run. This is what I call always the loyal strategy. The one that will never fail you, and you'll be always able to pick up the fruits as long as you're willing to spend the time and the consideration to follow it. So that was a great idea. And actually, after C4, white played bishop C2, and then black continues with B5. It's really smart. That type of move 
sets up very, very good control around the queen side area. There is absolutely nothing for us to worry because it's all perfectly well placed there. Let's not forget that. And then black is um, ready. He might continue with moose like, say, uh, pawn up to the a5, you know, rook to the b8 or rook to the a7. Yes. See, this is what I call consistency. Not in consistency in calculating, but consistency in figuring out what the position requires and simply adding to it. A little bonus, a little another benefit towards another benefit towards another benefit. And then suddenly you have all these structural qualities that give you the big advantage. That's as simple as that. White played a4 here. He, I don't know what he wanted to do. Probably he just didn't want to stay in a situation where everything just looks bad. It was understandable why. I mean, I wouldn't like to be in this position with white. So he just pushed. Black advanced. F3 and bishop g5. And see how slowly and yet very effectively things go great. It's about that. It's not about tactics. It's about slowly and yet effectively making sure that your pieces and your development could serve. The long-term effect. It's beautiful. Now White's almost losing. I'm not going to say that he's losing because he's probably not losing, but you get my point. It is difficult, extremely painful to play this type of position. And he continues to just suffer even more. How exactly? Well, Bishop F2, now Black plays with the move of uh, Bishop to the F4. What's quite good about this is that now whites are having a very valuable weakness that we are targeting all our pieces against, and um, surely, um, you know, and painfully, actually, I'd like to say, he cannot continue. There's no way on how he can defend that pawn, and there's no way on how he can do anything else. So as of this matter, as of this position, so this moment, Black just keeps on improving. He gets that rook that he got on the square of d8. The position feels perfect, and uh, there is just so much, so much more. Okay, so what what is the what does White do? I mean, this is not a convenient position. Apparently, it's just White has limited options, no space, and certainly nothing he can do. How does Black achieve this? By playing simple. And what I mean is avoiding any actual weakness and constantly trying and figuring out ways to make the position work. It was beautiful. Strong and beautiful at the same time. So what's happening now? After the move uh, of bishop b6, black played bishop to the g3 himself. Is very strong with that idea because now you realize the real deal and what this does. You know, it c cuts cuts off White's pieces from being able to do much. He played the move of Rook to the e2, but it didn't change much because Black just continues getting more space. Take a look at this. We don't do anything but to improve again and again and again and again. Maybe with a, little, with a little bit of a move that helps us to get space. Maybe it's a little different idea just giving us uh, some more advanced bees where we need it. Doesn't matter. As long as it keeps growing, that is what we're looking to do. White played king of one, and then black plays king of seven. Small moves of that kind do come out. You know, white's trying bishop c7 and here or there. He wants to do something, but it doesn't matter. The reality is Black's got all the time in the world. And yes, I want to talk about pacing right now. How do we determine pacing? How do we know if we should hurry or, you know, slow down? Think about these positions in a little bit quicker or slower manner. But it all depends on your opponent. That's what I can tell you. If your opponent has gotten some possibility to attack you, threaten you, then likely you have to rush. You want to rush because slowing down in such a position is going to be, is going to kill you. So that's very needed. However, if your opponent hasn't gotten that type of possibility, he is not creating any real tactics. 
you can slow down as much as you want and take the time to reinforce the position. Static strategy is fairly helpful as long as your opponent does not attack or threaten you in any way. So now we just make it work. It's a great position, and uh, that's really the reason why we, we love to have it. And yeah, so actually after that type of move, apparently white uh, has to do rook a1. Going back with that rook, but uh, after rook a1, black played rook b8, rook b7. See, it took a long time before black played d4. If it was in the hands of a normal player who just likes to hurry things, rush it up, and then advance, they would play d4 right away. But not Karana, he didn't. Why? Because he wanted to make everything certain. Looking at the opponent, he found out there was nothing out there that could bug him. There was no chance, no solid possibility, no threats, no danger, nothing. So why don't we just take this slowly? It was very effective. Slowly taking the rooks, getting the pawns, bringing up the pieces that we most need. And finally, when everything is ready, we strike. That's it. That's right. We strike. Because it's all there. Now the knight involved and with the bishop, with the rooks, and with the possible pass pawn, there's really not going to be anything that white can do to make himself better. That's what matters so very much. And that's really why black did it. You know, the, the interesting part of it all is just the way and how... Um, you know, it worked for black. The whole idea with the knight coming down, with the e5 being taken. I mean, you see, black just coordinated this piece, and he actually started creating real threats, which was expected. You know, this everything you know was supposed to lead to that, but it wasn't just like that. It didn't happen spontaneously and out of nothing. It was very meticulously prepared, and so once black takes that pawn, you realize how effectively. All these exchanges really help in one special specific direction. There is no ability for any of White's bishops to actually try or do anything. There's rook b1, rook g1, rook b1, king f6, bishop f4, and rook d8. We have the bishop challenged, we have the attack against the b4, and we have uh, White ultimately losing it because he can't make much. Even with the pawn on c3, black is setting up to attack with through the d2, rook c8, and h5. Being a pawn up gives black a fantastic chance to further improve and strengthen the position as he wants. Going up, that means he can do rook b2, h4, king e5, rook d8, and there is oh, so much more he can actually achieve in this position. Uh, so that's fine. I mean, like, you know, really what the key, the, key, the, key, the key thing about these type of positions is get yourself enough time. Figure out the way to build up. And when you do, everything is going to work. Just the way it worked here was um you know amazing in this in this position so this is very important uh you know like i love the idea because the most important of all this is just how black was able to build and constantly improve forcing his pieces on better positions and pushing white down so that there was nothing left once the past pawn was executed in such a manner so I do hope that you enjoyed this game and you learn about simplicity a bit more from the other lectures. Don't forget to check below the video. The link below the video offers a brilliant discount of an amazing package. Uh, so take a look at it. It covers a lot of that stuff so you can learn from it. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend. I'll speak to you in two weeks.